Hey, everybody. We're continuing on into chapter 8, um, which has a couple pretty crazy new topics, uh, right, that we've, we've already talked about. Uh, we've talked about nucleophilic hydrogen, or remember that, hydride, uh, H minus, H dot dot minus. That, those were reducing reactions. Um, there were a couple of reagents, I don't know, um, this is all review, <coughs> NABH4, LIALH4, right, those were reducing agents. We also talked about oxidizing agents, like the chromium things, chromium, CRO3, and PCC. Now we're on to this uh, chapter, or this uh, number six topic, nucleophilic carbon, which, you know, if, if reducing agents are H dot dot minus, uh, nucleophilic carbon is R dot dot minus. So it's some kind of carbon with a dot dot minus on it. And they can attack things like a ketone or an aldehyde for now. Those are the main things for now. There will be other things they attack later. Um, reviewing a couple ideas from before. Like one of the one of the ways to do this is with lithium. So these are called uh, organolithium. It, like, Propyl lithium, three carbons lithium. It, it's kind of the structure is kind of semi-covalent and semi-ionic. So sometimes we draw it one way, sometimes we draw it the other way. It's the reality is it's somewhere in the middle between these two kind of extremes. Um, there's also the organomagnesiums, which are have another name. Remember the other name? It's a French name. Uh, Grignard, G-R-I-G-N-A-R-D. Uh, and you, the middle G is silent, so it's Grignard, G-R-I-G-N-A-R-D. And it almost sounds like there's a Y in there, like Grignard, like Y-A-R-D, but it's really uh, N-A-R-D, which is the way you pronounce it. Anyway, these kind of do the same sort of thing. They're nucleophilic carbon, right? Um, it's a carbanion. How do you make them? You could either... Uh, like for a Grignard, you just have the alkyl halide and then you treat it with magnesium and the magnesium sneaks in between the carbon-bromine bond, like that. Um, there's no mechanism for the formation of either Grignard or organolithium. Just don't, don't even try to draw it because you'll get it wrong. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated mechanism that we just don't discuss, all right? I know you guys love mechanisms and want a mechanism for everything, but this is one mechanism that we're, we're just going to skip altogether. Um, we talked about how they're highly basic, so um, uh, like there's an organolithium, carbon lithium, and how it's it very it, it's one of the strongest bases in the universe to our knowledge, um, and it will rip off a proton from a lot of things with a pKa under <laughs> 60. We'll say under you know under 50 or so it, it's very quantitative and so water will provide its proton and then it just becomes a CH3 group we talked about that same for Grignard Grignard's the magnesium one this is all review from last time um, so it's very easy to reduce a, hal a halogen a, a halo alkane to a alkane just by just making an organolithium or Grignard and then throw an H2O and it, it makes this all right uh, what else to review um, I'm going to jump down to this part E, synthesis of alcohols. This is a huge, huge, huge topic that's going to be uh, a recurring theme all the way to the end of Organic 2. The idea that we can make alcohols by reacting organometallic reagents with ketones or aldehydes. Uh, here is one example where we used formaldehyde. So we made a we we had a Grignard and the Grignard can be shown in the covalent form or the ionic form. Here we're just you know showing the ionic form to go do the attack. So we we uh, we have a lone pair of electrons, carbon ion, and it attacks the formaldehyde. And we uh, three plus one is four, so we get our four carbons, and then it's a two-step process. So it attacks, then we protonate the O minus, and that makes a primary alcohol. Okay, and uh, what about, uh, how do we make a secondary alcohol? For, to make secondary alcohols, you do the same kind of thing. Here we're using organolithium, and then we use an aldehyde. So, 
organolithium or grenard plus an aldehyde makes a secondary alcohol. Okay? To make a primary alcohol, we used what? Formaldehyde. To make a secondary alcohol, we use an aldehyde, a normal aldehyde with a carbon thing on it. So it's carbon something, C double bond H. Okay? And how do you make a tertiary alcohol? How do you make it what what functional group? What which electrophilic functional group would you react with to make a tertiary alcohol? And a tertiary alcohol is an extra carbon, right? So what, does that make sense, my question? Which electrophilic functional group, because this is an electrophilic functional group, would you react one of these with to make a ketone? Sorry, <laughs> I gave it away. I gave it away to make a tertiary alcohol. And the answer is a ketone. So if this was a ketone, if this was a ketone, you'd make a tertiary alcohol. And that's what I show pretty much at the end of the last lecture was that, oh, look at that. All right, so I have an organomagnesium grignard reacting with a ketone. And when it reacts with a ketone, your end result is a tertiary alcohol. All right, so. All right, so a summary of what I just kind of said in a couple of words is that the, the nature of the electrophile determines the nature of the product. And sometimes when you're looking at the product and trying to, and you're trying to figure out, hmm, which electrophile would I use to make this product, um, you can kind of step back to figure out what, what the electrophile is. And that's using a couple of the rules we just said. So I said that if you have a, like formaldehyde as your electrophile, what kind of alcohol do you make, as we just showed? If you're using formaldehyde as your electrophile, you make a primary alcohol. If you use an aldehyde as an electrophile in these reactions, you make a secondary alcohol. And just as we showed up here, if you have a ketone as an electrophile, what kind of alcohol do you get? A tertiary alcohol. And I'm just showing formaldehyde, aldehyde, and ketone this way. Sort of shorthand. Ketone, of course, can have a R and an R prime, meaning there's two different sides to the ketone. Okay. Alright, so I'm going to, real quickly, I'm going to take a quick tangent to sort of review a couple of the key things that we already talked about in chapter 8. Quick review. And then I'll keep going with the Grignard and organolithium stuff. Uh, but it's good to just take, take a step back and, and remind ourselves where we are. Uh, first thing I want to review is uh, what are the types, what are the, the kinds or types of hydride reagents? What are the types of hydride reagents? Because we talked about a couple of them, but there's actually, uh, we actually talked about two of them in detail, right? Remember those two hydride reagents? It, hydride is H minus, H dot dot minus. There were uh, NABH4 and LIALH4, right? Uh, but there's actually a third one, I just want to mention it. Because there's, there's NAH, it's a different one. And then we have NABH4 and LI. ALH4. So what's this NAH one? Because that's a little weird. Um, so they're all kind of the same thing. They're all kind of H minus. So they are, uh, this one's kind of like H dot dot minus Na plus. This one's kind of like H dot dot minus Well, it's actually uh, 
This one's kind of like BH4 minus Na plus in quotes, right? And this one's kind of like ALH4 minus lithium plus, okay? In quotes. All right, so we talked about these ones extensively in this chapter, but what's what's this NAH one, and what is that going to uh, come up? Because we will use it from time to time also. So the these ones are the ones we really talked about in chapter eight, and, and they're primarily nucleophilic H minus. Primarily nucleophilic. H dot dot minus. So we use them as nucleophiles. And we use them as reducing agents to reduce the ketones and aldehydes and stuff like that. Um, and the NABH4 one is uh, non basic, non basic. And we can uh, use al alcohol, ethanol, as a solvent. And it's, it's relatively well behaved, right? This is the one we said, oh, you know, if you're going to use this um, for general use, this is good because it's not going to catch on fire, really. This one, you have to be very careful because if, if you do something wrong, it's going to catch the whole lab on fire. So it's very, very uh, troublesome. There's a lot of instances of people accidentally catching their labs on fire with this really kind of dangerous and highly reactive one. So this is actually, this is ba basic also. In addition to being nucleophilic, it's also basic. And, and by being basic, ethanol is bad because ethanol can, you know, it'll provide a proton as a solvent and then your your reagent will uh, catch on fire, basically. All right, so ethanol is bad. That's why when we use lithium aluminum hydride, we do this as a, as a two-step process. First, you do the reduction, H minus. Then you do H plus, like a H three water or something, very gently and carefully, and then and then it prevents a fire from occurring. This one we can just use ethanol as our our solvent because it's it's not as reactive. This is a, a gentle a gentle reagent. Okay. What about this one? Well, this one is primarily used, primarily basic. So we use it, if we need a, a hydride base for the purpose of just ripping off a proton, this is a, you know, a super base. This is one of our super bases. Super base. You know, in a case, occasionally we just need a strong base to go rip off a proton. And AH is one of the, our super bases. It's primarily used as a base. Um, and when do we when do we actually use it? Um, that'll actually be kind of next next chapter where we see it a lot. But uh, the pr the main use we we uh, have for for NAH NA it's Na plus H minus or just NAH right NAH sodium hydride. NAH, um, is synthetic deprotonation of alcohols. Synthetic deprotonation of alcohols. We already talked about that. That was in the, uh, I think that was in the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint for chapter 8, for this chapter. We talked about synthetic deprotonation of alcohols, very end of the PowerPoint series. But anyway, what does that mean? It means you got an alcohol and you want to take off the proton. How do you take off that proton? You just want to rip off the take out alcohol, rip off the proton, and leave like a sodium plus. You would use NaH. It's a really good base for that. It's a, you know, and this will take off the proton. It's just a base. It's not a nucleophile or anything rips off the proton and you get this and then if you want to do an SN2 reaction you could you know do an SN2 with, with another uh, uh, piece. I'm going to add a methyl here and a methyl here just to distinguish them all. Okay, Alright, so I've had that alcohol, want to rip off the proton, NaH, 
gives me the alkoxide, and then I can do an SN2 reaction. And that's really cool. That's what we mean by synthetic deprotonation of alcohols. Okay? Alright, so we're still on our little tangent. This is the tangent quick review of chapter 8 stuff. Now I have a, a little more tangent, and then we ba go back into the, the key topics. Tangent. Quick. Review. Part 2. So just a little bit more of just overall review from where we are right now in Chapter 8. Um, and this is just first on oxidations. We, we know, we talked about oxidations, but then we kind of stopped talking about them. What are the two ways we can oxidize? The two, two typical ways of like a primary alcohol. Um, you could use like PCC, or you could use CrO3H3O. And one of them is a partial oxidation, and one's a full oxidation. Which is which? Well, the top one's the partial, the bottom's the full. So the partial oxidation of an aldehyde would be... Sorry, partial oxidation of a primary alcohol would be to aldehyde. The full oxidation of a primary alcohol would be to a carboxylic acid. Right, so this is the partial and the full. And what was the abbreviation for oxidation we use? Bracket O bracket. Partial oxidation, full oxidation. Alright, so then that makes these two things okay. Um, and then and then, uh, then we moved on to reduction. That was oxidation. Reduction, there's kind of like two ways you can reduce a ketone or aldehyde. You can either use NABH4 in a solvent like ethanol, NABH4 and ethanol, or you could do a two-step lithium aluminum hydride, and then like acid water. You have to do the two steps to prevent the. You can't you can't use ethanol, for example, like with lithium aluminum hydride. What's the solvent we might use with lithium aluminum hydride? Like THF is our solvent. Okay. Uh, both of these, it's essentially an H minus, and the end product is an alcohol, a secondary alcohol. Okay, so that's a little bit of review also for the hydrate. And now we're into the other thing, which is like rather than a nucleophilic H minus is more like a nucleophilic R minus. So I'll say like ethyl Grignard. And then like water or acid. And so this is H minus. And what's this? This is like what we call R minus. So it's a carbon with a minus. And in this case it's, it's ethyl. Ethyl Grignard. Now I'll draw it out as H3C CH2 dot dot minus and then it reacts kind of the same way that H minus reacted, but it's now it's like R minus reacts. And rather than getting a secondary alcohol where you, you have an H that we added, you get a tertiary alcohol. Okay, cool. So that's our little tangent, and now let's keep going with the with the uh, where we are with the, the Grignards and organolithiums. All right, so moving onward, we're on topic number six: nucleophilic carbon, nucleophilic carbon, and we could you know abbreviate all of that as just R dot dot minus quotes R dot dot minus in quotes. We're talking about the synthesis of alcohols. Synthesis of alcohols by nucleophilic carbon. And we'll just show a couple more examples of this. Um, here's a Grignard. Grignards are 
MGBR things. Let's react this one with, uh, we'll call that methyl ethyl ketone, right? It's methyl ethyl ketone. Water or acid as our second step. And what is the, first of all, if this is a ketone and we're reacting a Grignard with a ketone, what kind of alcohol will we get? What do we say? If it's a, if it's a ketone, you get a, some kind of alcohol. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? It's going to be a tertiary alcohol. But not even thinking about that, we can just do the mechanism. And remember, there's two ways I can do the mechanism. I can either go from the line and just be like, you know, have the line attacks. Or I could draw, redraw this as like benzene CH2 dot dot minus. Okay? So this, of course, I could redraw as benzene CH2 dot dot minus MGBR plus right and then I can just circle the lone pair and go go attack the ketone but remember I can, the other way I can do it is just have uh, the line attack just circle the line which is a pair of electrons Okay, and then attack, and then you make the alkoxide. So carbon, and then we and then we have a new carbon-carbon bond. So that carbon to that carbon, and on this new carbon, we have a what and a what. We have well, we have three things. We have an oxygen, we have a methyl, and we have an ethyl. So we have. I could draw it like that or something, right? A methyl and an ethyl and the O minus. Sometimes I also like to do a little squiggly line. That's a little squiggly line between the bonds that I formed. Because that, that bond was formed, right? It was a CC bond forming reaction. Okay, and then the next step, of course, is the O minus grabs the proton to uh, push electrons onto oxygen. And the final product is, I'll just redraw it kind of like this. As long, you know, there's, there's a bunch of ways you can draw it. I just flip the oxygen down. But that's correct. And I also might draw the little squiggly line right there to kind of indicate where the bond was created. Let me try to make it a little more squiggly. Let's make it as squiggly as possible. Very squiggly. Let's see if I can do it. Squiggly. There we go. So that shows, oh, I made that bond. And I can also confirm this sort of arithmet arithmetically. How many carbons are on the left? Well, six, seven, right? Six, seven. How many carbons are here? Four. So 7 plus 4 should be 11. Let's see if I get 11. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. All right, so our math makes sense. Okay, um, let's just do one more. Um, I'll just take this molecule. Um, it's tertiary, tertiary bromide. How do I convert this to the, do I want to make a Grignard or an Organolithium? What do you think? I'll, I'll say Lithium this time. No big deal. Magnesium, Lithium, basically do the same thing. Uh, so to do that is Lithium and like THF. Remember that's how you make it. Don't think mechanistically of like, oh this attacks and kicks it off because that's not what happens. And even if it did happen, you wouldn't work on a tertiary anyway. So there's, not, there's no simple mechanism. No mechanism. So don't think about mechanism of this reaction. The, the other reaction is easy. Like this is a good, easy mechanism, right? But the actual formation of the organolithium or Grignard, there's no easy mechanism. All right, so um, this time we'll react with an aldehyde. Okay, so if I'm reacting with an aldehyde, am I making a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? 
Remember with the ketone, you made a tertiary alcohol, right? Because there's three things on the carbon. And if I'm reacting with an aldehyde, I make a secondary alcohol. And I'm going to do the same little mechanistic shortcut by circling the bond. Right? So the carbon is attacking this carbon at this carbon and the electrons go up onto oxygen. It's probably best to, to draw the arrow go onto the oxygen. It's kind of like that, right? Okay, what's the intermediate look like? Well, it's that, and that bond is connected to that bond, that carbon. That carbon is connected to that carbon. And on this carbon, we have an oxygen and this isopropyl group. So O minus isopropyl. And then to finish up the mechanism, O minus grabs the proton from water. What do we say it was? A primary, secondary, or tertiary? If you react with an aldehyde, it is a primary, secondary, tertiary. That's a secondary alcohol, right? Secondary alcohol. And what happened if, what kind of alcohol, if you react with a ketone? It's a tertiary alcohol. Okay, good. Okay, what about if I if I give you the product, given the product, I ask you to propose a synthesis. Propose a synthesis uh, of a alcohol, some kind of alcohol. Because remember, our products here are alcohols, right? The product of a vineyard is always an alcohol. So if I say, here's an alcohol, please make it. Propose a synthesis to make this alcohol. Um, how many possible syntheses are there? And we're just going to think about the, the CC bond forming reaction of this to make this alcohol. So propose a synthesis of this alcohol. First question might be, you know, given the fact that it's a, is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? Given that, um, what kind of electrophile are we going to use? Remember that whole thing? It's like, oh, the formaldehyde makes primary, aldehydes make secondary, ketones make tertiary, right? Well, this looks like a secondary, right? So this is a secondary alcohol, and that kind of implies what kind of electrophile we're we going to use? A aldehyde. So we just talked about that a few minutes ago. When you react with an aldehyde as an electrophile, you um, create secondary alcohol. Okay. All right. So there's kind of I like to do this when I'm like proposing a synthesis of an alcohol like this. What I like to do is I, I'm going to what's my little convention? I'm going to draw a squiggly line in two different places because there's going to be two different ways we can make this alcohol. I can either imagine kind of react the the uh, the right side which would be like a methyl like a Grignard, a methyl Grignard, CH3 Grignard with that as an aldehyde right so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an alcohol it would be an aldehyde it would be C double bond or the other way to do it would be this thing right how many carbons is that? Four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Six carbons. Six carbons and like a Grignard or organolithium with this, but as an aldehyde. So six plus two is eight, right? Six plus two would be eight. Let's see, is this eight carbons? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight carbons. So, right, I can either envision, make, 
synthesize one bond or the other bond using a Grignard. And I'm going to sort of suggest this with squiggly lines, my favorite little squiggly line. There's going to be squiggly line number one, and I'm going to call this... Well, let's draw the two squiggly lines. So I can envision one squiggly line, squiggly line or another squiggly line. I'm going to label one uh, B and the other one A. So this is, these are my two approaches. I have two approaches to making this molecule. By squiggly line, squiggly line A or squiggly line B. And each of those will be a different type of Grignard reaction. All right? So for A, it'll be one thing. For B, it'll be another thing. And we're kind of working our way backwards here, right? So for A, for A, what is my Grignard reagent going to be? And what is my aldehyde going to be for A? The best way to do this is with your thumb or something, cover up like one side of the molecule. You're like, all right, it looks like it's a single CH3, right? Methyl. CH3 Grignard, like methyl Grignard. And then that will be the aldehyde, right? So it's one carbon plus seven carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One plus seven is eight, right? So for A, I'm going to draw it. I'm going to just draw the aldehyde. It's a two step process. What's step two? Step two is. Step two in a Grignard is always water. It could be Grignard or organolithium, it doesn't matter. Um, but then what's my Grignard? How many carbons is it again? It's one, right? It's a CH3. CH3 MGBR. Ah, it's cool, that's cool. So I just proposed a synthesis of this secondary alcohol. So this, of course, would make that product, the desired product, right? Okay. Now, I should point out, like I could, like for, as my left thing and my my reagent thing, I could either draw the aldehyde here, or I could draw the like the Grignard here, the MGBR thing, and then and then I'd have the aldehyde over over the arrow. I can draw it one way or the other, and they're both fine. Okay. So, for example, in the in here it's like electrophile, nucleophile. I could have nucleophile, you know, nucleophile, electrophile. It doesn't really matter as long as I clearly show it's a two-step process. What I draw over here doesn't really matter. So, for example, if this is electrophile, nucleophile, for B, now I'm going to draw the nucleophile as my starting material, right? So, what's the nucleophile for B? Get my thumb out and knowing I'm going to react a Grignard or organolithium with a aldehyde. We know it's an aldehyde because it's a secondary alcohol. All right, there's my Grignard or organolithium, right? That's going to be the Grignard or organolithium. How many carbons is that? That's actually the, the how many carbons is that now? Hmm. Four, five, six carbons, yeah, six carbons. And then my aldehyde will be how many carbons? Two carbons. Six plus two is eight, right? So, uh, this time I'm going to start with the Grignard, and I'll just kind of cover this up and to see see what the structure is. This can be the, this whole thing, tributyl. Right, there we go. And what is the structure of the aldehyde? How many carbons is the aldehyde? How many carbons is that? One, two, two, two carbon aldehyde. All right, there's our two carbon aldehyde. What's the step two of a Grignard? It's water. It could be water or H3O plus. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Okay. And that gives the same product, right? So we have two different approaches to make that product. Let me rephrase approach B slightly differently, just to 
you know, to uh, show that this could be expressed one way or it could be expressed the other way. I could draw it the same exact thing correctly as just the aldehyde. And then the Grignard, it will be it'll be one H2O. Uh, then I just draw that Grignard up there. My point is it's they're the same same thing. Right? See how this is the same as this, and they give rise to the same product? Okay. Good. Okay, so now we know the basic idea of this Grignard and organolithium stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of cool homework problems to reinforce this, and that would definitely help you in the, the quizzes and stuff. Um, but let's move on to uh, kind of the, a, a more general topic, um, introduction to synthetic strategy. What do, we, what do we mean by that? And we just showed a synthetic strategy just a second ago. I, I drew a product and say, hey, let's make it. And, and you had to sort of plan the, you know, two different Grignard approaches to making that molecule. Um, so, very soon, you're going to have crazy synthetic problems with multiple steps upwards to like seven or eight steps of organic chemistry. It sounds horribly terrifying, but we're going to be there soon. And, and, and in order to do that, we need to address this idea of synthetic strategy. It's just like, um, how do we construct a synthesis? How do we propose a synthesis? So we're starting to learn reactions, right? Starting to learn reactions. How many reactions do you know? You know, you know, you know, Starting from a couple chapters ago, you know, radical bromination, you know, SN2, E2, SN1, E1, you know, oxidation, you know, reduction, now you know Grignard, all this kind of stuff. Um, you probably don't even know how much you know, but you do actually know a lot of reactions. When I say reactions, I like to say uh, the vocabulary. Of Ochem. you know the vocabulary of organic chemistry, right? So, what good is a vocabulary if you can't like make a, a sentence, right? So if you learn some words and you don't know what to do with the words, then you're, you're not really, you haven't really advanced in a language or, in this case, or organic chemistry. So now that we have a vocabulary, now we sh will try to construct sentences sentences. We're going to have a lot of practice of this. It's not going to be, not going to be immediate. You know, we, we got to take baby steps first and then we're going to move on to very complicated sentences. Okay, so, so I, I mentioned this already. Uh, from here on, from here on, we will learn by we, I mean you, will learn lots of new reactions. Lots and lots and lots, all the way through the end of organic too. And so each of these reactions is kind of like a different word, and, and like we can construct cool sentences. All right. And so how do we how do we, how do we um, learn all of them? I mean, in the normal class, you have to memorize them all. Um, you still, in, in this class, in, in the remote learning version of organic chemistry, you still got to learn them, but you have other things at your disposal. I still think, um, I like the idea of uh, index cards, and I, I, I mean, even though you have all your notes in front of you, it's going to be very easy to get lost in all of it. So index cards are a really good idea. Um, and index cards, uh, if, not only just a stack of index cards, because a stack of index cards might be um, might be a little overwhelming, but kind of uh, organized by mechanism type, 
organize by mechanism type. That might be a good idea. Maybe even by chapter. Maybe by chapter. Some kind of way to organize this stuff because you're going to have a lot of reactions. Um, and then I would have like, you know, maybe a little stack of index cards for chapter 7 and chap little index cards, stack of index cards for chapter 8, you know, the all call chapter. And then chapter 9, you're going to have a bunch of reactions in chapter 9 also. And, um, and so, um, some ideas for maybe index cards might be, one of them might be NABH4. Right, it's a reduction. Nucleophilic H minus. You might have an index card index card for lithium aluminum hydride, which is also H minus. Nucleophilic H minus. Might have an index card for chromium six, which is PCC or CRO three. The idea might be to have like um, on the front of the index card like a good solid example and on the back the full mechanism so then you can kind of quiz yourself on like oh what's the, what's the mechanism of this reaction I see what it does but what's the mechanism that might be a useful thing any more you know you know others uh, maybe BR2 and light remember that one first thing you learned radical bromination right and, and there's a four step kind of complicated mechanism radical Halogenation of an alkane. We also now know R MGBR or R lithium. They basically do the same thing. But you might show uh, the synthesis, how do you make them, and then how do you use them. Those kind of things. We need some way to kind of keep all this straight in your mind. Um, um, all right. And let's see. All right, so once we kind of have a grasp of our reactions, and I'll assume you kind of know your basic reactions, and you might be ru rusty here and there. Um, and we want to like synthesize a complicated molecule. Uh, how do we approach this? We we need to. Um, the goal of ours should be to utilize strategy. Strategy. What does strategy even mean? I mean, it means that like, you have to think about it. Like strategy to plan synthesis. How do we use strategy to plan synthesis? Well, we haven't really seen too much synthesis, but we're going to see examples of it. And strategy kind of might be like a chess game, or like I don't know what kind of games the kids play nowadays. A video game. Uh, where you're like, I, I, have, I have to get from A to B, and how do I do that? I have to like think about some some uh, strategy. It might be a multi-step process to get from from A to B, and um, and there's kind of like in, in organic chemistry, there's there's sort of two approaches to, for this. Two approaches you could envision if I'm doing a multi-step synthesis. Two approaches I could I could envision forward synthesis. Or something called retrosynthesis. 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 T H E S I S. Forward synthesis or retrosynthesis. These are two kind of complementary approaches to uh, plan in organic synthesis. Synthesis. And by that, let's let's just think in, in abstract terms. All right. Forward synthesis and retrosynthesis. So say I'm trying to go from molecule A to D. I'm going go from molecule A. And I, got, I got to go from molecule A to molecule D. What are the two approaches? Forward synthesis, retrosynthesis. So forward synthesis would mean, well, okay, I have molecule A. I know some reactions I can do to molecule A. I can be like, hmm, maybe I can make that into molecule B. 
okay, and then I'll like, I'll try, uh, figure out, okay, well if I make molecule C, then I can make molecule D, right? So, say like dot dot dot, it's like, the point behind forward synthesis is look at your molecule, your starting material, and then your goal, and be like, all right, if I can just keep working forward, 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 I get to where I want to go, right? Um, now, it turns out that's not the best way. <laughs> well, it, sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it'll work, but there's a uh, potentially better way, and that's this idea of retrosynthesis. Retrosynthesis. And I'll show them both. So, versus retrosynthesis. Retrosynthesis is going to be kind of the opposite way, where I'm like, all right, I got to go from molecule A to molecule D. So, in retrosynthesis, what I do is I don't look at A really. I, I might keep it in the back of my mind, but I really do is I look at D. I'm like, oh, okay. What, what are, what's, if I analyze this carefully, D, I can figure out, hmm, maybe I can make D from C. Okay, and C is kind of looking like A, and then I'm like, all right, maybe if I keep analyzing C, I'll figure out, oh, what's B? And then B really looks like A, so now I'm like very close. I'm like, now I know how to go from A to B. So I'm just going to say dot, dot, dot. The idea between these two methods is forward synthesis, you kind of go from A, B, C. Retrosynthesis, you kind of go from D back to C, B, eventually working your way back to A. Okay? All right. So let's show an example of this, to, in a, a real example. All right. Because I know this A, B, C, D stuff doesn't really make any sense to you. All right, so what if we have, as a real example, what if we have methyl cyclohexane, and I ask you, please make this tertiary alcohol. All right, synthesize it. Real example, synthesize, go from here to there. And and I'm going to demonstrate the retrosynthetic approach. Because if you try to do the forward synth synthetic approach, you may get stuck. It's like, you know, how would, how would you even do anything to this molecule that will get you in the direction of this? If you know your reactions well, you might be able to do that. But what I'm trying to do is show retrosynthesis, the idea of going backwards. All right? So let's look at this. Hmm. All right. I see. What do I see? I see a tertiary alcohol. And I, I see... Also, I see the methyl group that I kind of start with. It's right there, it looks like. It looks like that methyl became this methyl. And then I see this thing kind of attached. When I see the retro, sorry, when I see the uh, tertiary alcohol, does that imply, which, al which electrophile is that? Formaldehyde, an aldehyde, or a ketone? Probably a ketone, right? Remember tertiary alcohols and ketones, as we said. Other thing we might do is, uh, I, I, it looks very clearly like this was seven carbons, this is seven plus three is ten, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, maybe we should draw a squiggly line somewhere. Where's our squiggly line going to go? I think it goes right there. That's a good squiggly, right? Because we're going to probably make that bond, right? Okay, well, anyway, so giving our, our the reactions we know, and, and now we know how to make CC bonds with the Grignard reaction, maybe we can plan the going backwards. We're doing retrosynthesis. Maybe we can make that bond from a something and a something. It looks like one thing will be a ketone with how many carbons? How many carbons in the ketone? Hmm, one, two, three. Three carbon ketone. And this might be that seven carbon Grignard, right? Or organolithium, your choice. And all right, so that's cool. So maybe what I'll, I'll do is draw the Grignard, MGBR. And we, we don't know quite yet how to go all the way back here, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. But for now, that's, that's a reasonable last step of the synthesis as we do our retrosynthesis. So Grignard has how many steps? 
two steps to make the to to uh, react right. Step two is always water, and then the Grignard reacts with a what to make that alcohol, tertiary alcohol. What does it make? A, is it a ketone, aldehyde, or formaldehyde? Uh, probably ketone. And how many carbons in the ketone? Oh, it's a three-carbon ketone. What's that called? There's a name for this three-carbon ketone. It's called acetone, right? Now we could show the mechanism. Often, when we're doing a synthesis like this, we don't actually care about the mechanism. We don't. We don't necessarily show the show the uh, mechanism for every reaction. Okay. Um, unless, like on a quiz or, or exam or something, I might say, hey, draw the mechanism, and then you draw the mechanism. But in a synthesis, we usually skip mechanisms. Usually the mechanism is not part of the synthesis. I can always draw just this little mechanistic step to, you know, remind myself, um, you know, that, that's, the key, that's the key mechanism, mechanistic step. But I don't, in a synthesis, you usually don't draw the full mechanism. Okay, but we're not done. We still got a lot of lot to go, right? We're going from there to there. How do we make a Grignard? How do you make a Grignard? It's gonna look something like that, but there's right, what's the reaction? You get your index card out. The reaction to make a Grignard starts with what? You start with something and you add something and you get a Grignard. Um, MGBR, right? And the thing, the, the starting material is the bromide. What's the reagent? Magnesium. And it is dry THF, but that's not that big of a deal, and we, we often skip that. Solvent, dry THF. Okay, and now, well, we're, we've moved to where we're, we're working backwards retrosynthetically. Working backwards retrosynthetically. Are we done yet? We're not quite done. This uh, goes back to one of the first reactions you learned that we can actually do a um, a radical bromination, right? Tertiary selective. So remember, tertiary radicals are the best, and they um, very selective. So that tertiary position, if we brominate it, it'll be very selective, and you'll get this as your primary product. So what are the reagents? Remember the reagents, chapter three. Chapter three, what are the reagents? Br something, is it just Br? Or is it HBr or is it, uh, I don't know, NABr? It's Br2 and light. Remember that? Initiation, propagation one, propagation two, termination. So one of the reactions you learned, and that's how, that's how you introduce a bromine onto an alkane, right? That's a full synthesis and a full retrosynthesis, okay? So this is a really cool process that, you know, we're going to have a lot of examples and practice of this. Just as a little side note, um, this concept, retrosynthesis, might not seem that crazy. It's like, oh, just work backwards, right? Uh, this was the, this was a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Retrosynthesis was, it earned earned the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The concept, simply just going backwards in terms of synthesis, was Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Uh, E.J. Corey won it in 1990. Uh, and from Harvard. He's still alive. He's pretty old now. I think he's re he might be retired. But he uh, he did not only did he discover this idea of retrosynthesis. He did like uh, hundreds of syntheses of, of like complicated molecules using this technique, kind of you know st going going backwards and then f f from pretty easy starting materials, very complicated molecules from nature and uh, a lot of pharmaceutical type. Uh, items. Anyway, this simple concept, it, it might seem pretty simple, but this was a, a Nobel Prize. Yeah, I think he has a, he, I'm pretty sure he has a Wikipedia page and stuff if you want to read about him or or uh, Google him, E.J. Corey.
Okay, so we're still on seven synthetic strategy. We'll just do a couple more examples. Mm, how about benzene, three carbon alcohol, and we're going to do a synthesis, so arrow, arrow, question mark. Uh, that looks kind of easy, but there's a little bit of twist to this. What if I, you know, when we're doing this retro synthesis, what I, I like to just compare what, you know, well, we have that, we have that, and and notice the key differences. It looks like we've added uh, a two carbon piece, right? Mathematically, it looks like we have six, seven, eight, nine, nine carbons here. Let me write C9. C9, carbon nine. And how many carbons do we have here? Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's a useful observation. So somewhere in the synthesis, we're adding two carbons. It's not totally clear how we're going to do it, and, and let's let's try retrosynthesis. So what I would do is probably start and say, well, clearly something is being added, and let's draw a squiggly line. Where's the squiggly line? Well, we have the three carbons. Here's the three, and then two more. It's probably this bond is the one that was created. There's my little squiggly line. Okay, and what is this uh, primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? It looks like a... Is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? It looks like a secondary alcohol. And secondary alcohols are associated with which electrophilic functional group? Ketone, aldehyde, or formaldehyde? I think it would be an aldehyde, okay? And you can kind of see what the aldehyde is going to look like by get your, get your thumb out and maybe we can. There's two pieces, right? There's a grignard and the aldehyde. I'm not using my thumb, I'm using my index fingers here. Is this going to be the aldehyde side or the grignard side? Looks like two carbons with no oxygens. That looks like the grignard side, right? For fun, I'll do lithium this time, organolithium. So it's not technically a Grignard, because Grignard is the magnesium one. But we'll do, just to mix it up, we'll do, we'll do organolithium. Okay, what I just showed is two carbons, and that's probably the organolithium, or, you know, organometallic side. And then this side will be the, the aldehyde side. So if that was an aldehyde, it would be a perfect substrate for this reaction, right? If that was an aldehyde. Because Grignards react with ketones and aldehydes and formaldehyde. So if this was an aldehyde, just envision a double bond O. Instead of a single bond O, it would be a double bond O. That would be perfect to add this as our Grignard or organolithium. All right, so draw that out. I'm just going to redraw this as a bottom part as an aldehyde. So it's going to look like that and just Maybe draw it out like, like an aldehyde, right? What's step one and two? Well, what's step two? Step two is always water. Step one is, what's the two carbon Grignard? It's just, or, well, we're doing lithium this time, so ethyl lithium. Of course, mechanistically, which we don't need to draw the mechanism for synthesis, but it's so easy. We can just do the first step of the of the mechanism. Ethyl attacks, makes O minus, and then water. You know, usually though you don't have to draw the mechanism for us in this problem. All right. Okay. So now, how do we go from this alcohol to this aldehyde? Because before we did like a radical bromination or something, right? But now it's like now 
we're going from a primary alcohol, one, one bond to oxygen, to an aldehyde, which is two bonds to oxygen. Is that an oxidation or a reduction or something like that? Mm, one bond to oxygen to two bonds to oxygen is a oxidation or reduction. It should be an oxidation, right? So the question then is we, we actually know two ways to oxidize things. You could oxidize it in the partial manner, or you could oxidize it in the full manner. And we want to do the partial oxidation. So what is it? Is it PCC or CRO3 for partial? So it's PCC. Remember the solvent is dichloromethane. We, we often emit that DCM, dichloromethane, which is CH2Cl2. The PCC is the chromium-6 reagent that does the partial oxidation from a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. Okay. Uh, just another example. Uh, if we have this is rather than draw the starting material, we're just going to show all the different ways to make this tertiary alcohol. All right, we have a tertiary alcohol. How many ways can we make this just from a Grignard or organolithium? This is pretty easy. I'm just doing it. Doing it. I think the book does this problem. Uh, but yeah, we can envision three different ways. Those are my little squiggly lines. I can you know, have this be a nucleophile. Oh yeah, in, in tertiary alcohols, you make them from a ketone aldehyde or formaldehyde. Remember, tertiary alcohols you make from a ketone. So it's like we'd act, react that three carbon Grignard with that ketone, right? Just envision a C double bond O instead of an OH. Envision a C double bond O right there, and that would be a one way. And then you can do all three of them. And we'll just, I'll do this kind of quickly because this is pretty easy. I'm going to call this A, this B, and this C. So we have three different ways to do this. Either A, Grignard A attacks ketone, the other ketone, or Grignard B attacks the ketone, or Grignard C attacks the ketone with the other pieces. So let's do A, B, and C real quick. A, B, and C. Okay. So A. So for A, what's the what's the Grignard? It's going to be three carbons with a alkene at the end. And then the other piece would be a a ketone, right? Benzene, carbon carbon, C double bond O, ethyl. So benzene, I can abbreviate the benzene as pH. Alright, so there's for A, there's the ketone, and then draw MGBR like a, that piece, CH2 connected to MGBR. Okay. I could probably draw that nicer, but that's fine. For B, it looks like it's ethyl, ethyl Grignard. Ethyl Grignard, right? And then the, old, uh, the top part's all the ketone. So the top part being everything else. Okay, that assume that's a ketone now. And it looks like phenyl. See that? Now what about for C? The key the Grignard part is gonna be phenyl CH2 CH2 Grignard MGBR. So it's phenyl CH2 CH2 MGBR. And what's the ketone? ketone and then there's an ethyl on one side and this other piece on the other side, right? Isn't that cool? So we just did three different retrosynthetic approaches of that molecule. 
right? This is a little. This kind of problem is a little different than this kind of problem. This this is I think more fun because you have to kind of work your way backwards. And and as we learn more reactions, this gets kind of complicated, and it's kind of like a little puzzle. It's pretty cool. All right, let's do another another one, kind of like the the top variety. Another example. All right, we actually we have a name for this. Remember that the cyclohexane chapter. It's called decalin. There was like a cis and trans decalin, but anyway, uh, how would we go about installing a single aldehyde up top? A single little aldehyde up there. How do we do that? And we're going to focus on retrosynthesis. Here and there, I'll do the forward synthesis ma thing. Um, but I, we're, we definitely try to emphasize retrosynthesis because it's a really cool idea. It, it, it usually gets you where you want to go pretty easily. Okay, so we're going backwards, right? That's retrosynthesis. And we know also know is there a squiggly line? Any squiggly lines here? Hmm. Yeah, there's right there. There's our squiggly, right? There's the squiggly. Um, but is there any way to just, even if we add a Grignard, like a Grignard, to make an aldehyde like this, can you do that? Is there a way? Do we know a way that makes aldehydes through CC bond formation? We know a way to make alcohols through CC bond formation, but we don't know a way to make aldehydes. So that's trouble. How are we going to get from this and attach something with a CC bond and have an aldehyde? Well, the answer is we don't make the aldehyde through the CC bond formation. You have to, you know, when you learn your reactions, you need to learn what the starting materials are and what the products are, right? Start, you, know, you need to know what the starting materials are, what the products are, what the mechanism is, and uh, anything else. I think is uh, what the reagents are, right? What reactions do you know that make aldehydes? Do you know any reactions that make aldehydes? You do. It's not Grignard though. Grignards don't make aldehydes, right? Grignards make alcohols, right? All of these are alcohol making making reactions. So, um, yeah, so it's not going to be a Grignard because Grignards don't make aldehydes. Do you know any reactions that make aldehydes? Think, think, think. Anything that makes an aldehyde. Maybe an oxidation. Hmm, you know oxidations. Yeah, oxidations make aldehydes. What's Which one though? Is it CRO3 or is it PCC? Ah, it's PCC. Remember that? PCC makes aldehydes from primary alcohols. So is, there, is it possible that we could make this aldehyde from this primary alcohol? Totally. Yeah, just make it from the primary alcohol. And then, and then, um, now, we're, now we're positioned to maybe attach something like a Grignard that we can derive from this. Make a Grignard and then attack what? What's the one carbon electrophile that contains oxygen? And gives us a primary alcohol. Is it a ketone? It's not a ketone. Is it an aldehyde? It's not an aldehyde. Well, it is a special kind of aldehyde. It's that one carbon aldehyde. What's the one carbon aldehyde you know about? One carbon aldehyde is formaldehyde, right? So now we can make this from a Grignard. Right? A Grignard. Let's draw the Grignard, MGBR. Right? So, right, there's no, it's that carbon is the Grignard, and then it's a 1, 2. What's our 1 carbon electrophile? That gives us a primary alcohol. Ah, formaldehyde. Alright. And then water. And that would give us that primary alcohol. 
And again, we don't need a mechanism for the synthesis, but if we wanted to draw a little mechanism, it would just be the cir circle of the bond. Right. And that would connect that carbon to that carbon, right? Carbon to carbon, which is this carbon to that carbon. And then the water gives us the proton. That's the mechanism of the Grignard. We're still not done though. So, how do you make a Grignard? What's the starting material for a Grignard reagent synthesis? It doesn't just magically form itself. We gotta make it. So, we make it from the bromide. And what's the reagent? Magnesium. And how do we... Lastly, install the bromine. Hmm. That's, that goes back to chapter 3. We already saw this example, but it's just BR2 light. Or heat. Remember that? Initiation, propagation, termination, blah, blah, blah. That's all mechanism stuff. So we don't really know, need to draw the mechanism in a synthesis question. Um, there are more examples in the homework. Lots of fun examples to really practice this. You got to you got to get this down. And these are cool problems because they're pretty doable. You know, we like to start on the easy ones, and then we'll, we're going to transition to really difficult problems here pretty soon. Um, cool. Okay, so I think that's that's it for this time. I, I'll show another example in the next lecture.